Well, hello. Thank you for your speech. I'm Nicolas Pinto. I'm a student of fine arts. And uh, I, I meant to ask you, uh, in your personal experience, uh, how often do you find that people, the actual community, are cooperative or helpful in this kind of project? Like, uh, has it been a good, positive experience, or do you have to be like on top of the people all the time, or? You, yeah, that's a very good question, and honestly, I have to say it's a it's an uphill battle. It's an uphill battle. Getting people truly involved is one thing. Keeping them involved is another one. If you're if you're there, that's why the formation in within. That's why I start with school, and that's why I start with assumedly, and I have had in Doria Mitsia another help of three very good principals. And they actually really do. But we haven't finished the project at all there. It's really still in course. So I've had a lot of experience with art performances, <coughs> uh, international <coughs> ones. And every time, the big headache is if you leave the place, it, the, the thing falls apart. You have to constantly, you have to be the source of energy. So it's very difficult to, it's, you, you know, you have to release, use social Aikido, <laughs> get people to use their energy to get it going. Uh, but it's worse, eventually, and I've had some very successful things in uh, Madeira, for example, in, again, a Portuguese area, uh, Portuguese island. Uh, I do various different projects. This is just the one I wanted because it's connected better with uh, Jana's request. I think it's, it's a whole, the whole point. Your question is perfect, yeah? <coughs> we, we still need a really good strategy for that. Yeah, um, I mean, there could be a second part to the question, is that how could we develop it so that it's self-sustaining without needing to, like, without needing a central figure to maintain everything running? Like, new technologies maybe, the, or something like that? Well, I have, a, I'm never short of programs. I have invented another program called ThinkWire, and uh, it was realized with a friend we worked on this for 30 years without achieving anything, except in the last two years we actually made it happen. Thinkwire was another one of my obsession of getting my students to work together, not anymore just in the class, but when they were each one in their own house or room or whatever, right? Thinkwire was developed, be was thought before Twitter. But then once Twitter came, we decided that 140 characters is not enough. 140, uh, sorry, uh, you know, uh, science is not enough to really have an argument, but 500 is too much. So let's double the 140. We have 280 characters that we can actually put in, and then we can have questions, arguments, and responses. That's one thing. The second thing is you create a virtual platform so that you have a virtual topic, you know, which is there, let's say uh, community involvement or uh, democracy in the town or whatever. And it's moderated by one person. One or two, if they do it. But I mean, basically one person takes charge of moderating this. You have a number of either little groups of six, seven people, or a whole team. I have one international team which has 17 people from all over the world. And then you get them to discuss the things that you're interested, that they're interested in discussing, and you come up with solutions. That's one platform that allows to maintain, helps to maintain Glue between the various moments of true encounter, but the body encounter are essential. I mean, by that, the people have to have a face-to-face -face encounter. They don't work as well if they have never had it. It's not that they can't; they do. But if they, it is much, much better if they have met once or twice. But you don't have to have them all the time. This would work for education too. You could perfectly well have students who come a specific number of the time in the classroom and get to do real work together the way I just described, and then the rest of the time do their own studies at home. We, we need a combination of face-to-face -face and online. That's what, that's my better answer to your question. Thank you very much. We wanted to know do you believe a uh, big data could also be damaging or harmful for societies? Very good question. Very good, very serious question, and I'm going to try and answer the best I can. Yes. But it's not all. Let me explain. Um, the problem with big data is that it is there to stay. And we will change before they change it. 
before big data practice changes. Singapore is a study that you want to make to understand what's going on with big data today that is threatening. That is that in Singapore, uh, in 1975, I did my first trip to Singapore, and it was a third world city. The center of the city was just like the center of Tori Annunziata. It's called a river, and the river was filled with mess. It was dirty beyond belief. You had sampan, which were half sunk into that center. In 2000, I go back there, and I see the, one of the most modern cities of today's world. <coughs> Sparkling, with the river, high tourism, with restaurants and things everywhere around the river. I said, what happened? And then I remember that when I was there in 75, there were signs on the road saying, if you spit, you pay $50. I thought, this is ridiculous. I've never been anywhere in the world where you have a sign on the road saying, if you spit, you have to pay $50. $50 is a lot of money. 50 Singapore dollars was today the equivalent of 20 euros for spitting. And if you were kissing in the street, well, anyway. Oh, you go to jail, yeah? You wouldn't quite, not yet. No, but if you were gay, you would. That was pretty bad, right? The law of the land was applied with extreme rigor. And the city became what uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the prime minister, wanted. An investment threat, an investment for the rest of the world, a very clean place, and peace between four different ethnic groups. We're talking design still, eh? Four ethnic groups. Malays, um, Muslims, uh, Hindus, uh, Chinese, all these groups which, who were more than just competing with each other at that time were also having tribal warfare within the city, seven, 7 million people. So he cleaned up the city, he pacified the tribes, and he made the city an investment, uh, uh, you know, a uh, haven. But his son, Li Xianlu, has called on American MIT experts to use the data, big data, produced by every citizen through their smartphone, whether on or off. Your case too. You are being followed. I'm not trying to frighten you, but you are being traced. Right? So all that information is available, and now Mr. Trump has made that information available for free without actually asking permission. Now people can use my information, which is me, and actually sell it. Okay, so this is not good news. So what happens is that the MIT people say, okay, we're going to trace every, we're going to make this city all oh, smart, so smart. We're going to trace everything that happens here, but not just that happens to cars, technology, people, movement. No, what they do. The new rule is you cannot walk outside of your bathroom without being covered. Hello? I can't walk outside my bathroom without being covered. Now, who would know? Well, you never know. You never know where the cameras are. Yeah. All right, so, because cameras are like no bigger than this now. But I'm not saying that, I'm not putting that. The real thing is that everything you do is traced and classified. That's what is the future of big data. It's inevitable. We have already lost the control of our own thinking. No, we still have the illusion that we actually possess our own mind. Yes, we do. We sort of do. We sort of do. But it's also in the possession of a lot of people that we would never want to meet. We now have, people now have access to our thinking. Not directly. It's not yet there completely. But what they have is access to everything we wrote and everything we said. And that's going to be used in some fashion. So the first stage of that transition is going to be negative. And people will be angry. The second stage will be a new ethics. And I'm writing a book called The Ethics of Transparency in the Age of Big Data. Why? Because that's exactly what the problem is. We developed an ethic during the Renaissance, we being the Europeans. During the Renaissance, we developed a specific personal ethics, which was not a group ethics like the Middle Ages. Not a community ethics. We had directors of conscience. We had the Inquisition to check into what was happening in our minds. That's the story of the ethic developing with the Protestant versus the Catholics and the whole mess. Today we have this, the, the, the Sunni versus the Shia, but it's the same story. This time it's global. 
That is, the ethics become a very big issue. How you handle you know, decision making about what you want to do or where you want to go. This is a fundamental question that we are going to face again with big data. But then what happens is, in uh, Singapore, you can leave your wallet in the street, or you can let it drop there, and discover that you have done that in your hotel room, and you say, oh my god, I'm just... No, it's still there. And if it's not there, it's at the police office. Right? So there is a total different balance of what it is. If you're completely nude walking in the street, you're going to behave. Which is exactly what's going on now. So Singapore is a place to study, to understand, to follow, in order to understand where the future ethics are going to, to lead us. Meanwhile, it's also a very big problem, and the nasty part of it is already there, because Hien Sring, Hien, uh, uh, Hien, Hien uh, Lung, no, Lee Hien Siu, I keep forgetting his name. But anyway, he has now decided to go into uh, much more control of the population. In other words, before, you could always have access to your own data. It was a, it was a civic right. Now you don't. You have access to the practice of the government. The government was kind of a transparent government. It's not anymore. So the tendencies of... You would need, in a new ethics, a new government as well. You'd have to have a very transparent government, but transparency in such a way that it doesn't harm the potential of your of your country. So this is a this is what I'm trying to answer. Yes, it is very much a potential danger, but it is a structural danger, not just an episodic thing. It is the very ground under our feet that is changing. So then we have to change our dance. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I I wanted to ask. I think I haven't really understood how this project is uh, improving the happiness of the people. So if you could explain it again. I'm glad you asked the question. I think that the, the basic premise is that the sense of belonging is what is missing to many of the citizens of various places, partly because they are just transient, they're moving through it, they don't identify with the place, partly because they don't know anything about it, partly because they are in conflictual relationship, which in any kind of unhappy city would be. So the idea of actually sharing a project, getting involved with it, giving something instead of taking or, or you know, producing, is, some, is a step, I think, in the right direction. It's a way of actually moving to, into uh, uh, doing something that makes people at least meet each other and recognize each other in, within their own street. I mean, today we're in a situation where neighborhoods is simply a, it's a concept of the past. So I'm not saying that Europeans are much better than Canadians on that. that uh, and the Canadians are capable of neighborhoods too. But the idea of a real neighborhood kind of way, the way it was like you know, before I was born, uh, that's a... Uh, that's sort of gone. And so it's, it's, that's my answer. It gives them the sense of identity. People are, are desperate for having identity. Something they can relate to, that they, that they can actually sort of position themselves in the world, which a lot of people don't have. Thank you. Okay, so the last two questions, this group here, mm -hmm. and then Irene, and we will, and we will finish. Yeah. Thank you so for um, how important do you think involving children in your project is? And uh, then, uh, how do you think growing up in this uh, nowadays society, such, uh, such individualism and narcissism, will uh, end up with that uh, community feeling in you, you involving children? I think it's a, it's great. I mean, it's a perfect. The idea. I mean, I've, one of my slides says you start with young people. Uh, the kids themselves, as the kids in school, you know, uh, are already involved in the Fuji project, the one with the cone. Uh, and they love it, and it actually has made it has made a difference in the class. We re, we're making research now on what kind of project, what kind of uh, progress has been done by those children, and we're going to come up with a report. The point is, it's that's that's it. That's the whole idea. Start with the kids because the kids are sufficiently fresh and less shaped by complex, very complex process, so that they can introduce in their own lives new a new vision. And this is what it is. Our, our governments don't have vision. So, uh, <laughs> and that's a visionary thing to bring to a child. Thank you. Okay, so I read this book here. Yeah, yeah. One more? Um, yes. Mine is uh, more curiosity. You talked about you have a project for Spain. 
And I was just curious uh, if you could tell us something about well, it. Well, no, the idea was I, I, I developed, as I was invited to come here uh, to talk about this, I thought, well, I should give a Spanish example. And uh, that's what I was thinking, I was talking about Santiago. Uh -huh. The idea was that you could do it. Uh, it was my first, it was the first time I, I was looking at it uh, in a very much more systemic way. That is, how would you involve the government? You will, first of all, you make a European project. So you request money for support for creating this kind of thing. Then, of course, you'd have to do a great deal of, you'd have to have a great deal of government and regional support so that all the towns say, do it seriously. Then you'd have to have a distribution of information on how to go about it, what I did, but in a way, more elaborate and, and something you could actually distribute to all the mayors or their cultural councillors, assessors, and so on. You'd have to work with everybody to do it. And it would be a long-term project. But eventually what it would do is then give a sense of community to all the people who are posted in various parts of the world. And a uh, second question to that, uh, do you think there is a real interest from the government and people that really rule uh, us as our society not for enough. us to be happier, to make a better world, because I don't think there is such interest. Uh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Nor do I. No. But if, no, if nobody no. tells you about it, you will never think about it. Whereas somebody comes up and somebody starts it somewhere, you have to start some, some small place first and see how it grows. Uh, I, I'm absolutely certain that if nobody, no government today is into the ethics of transparency. They already aren't. They are not, it, and the ethics of transparency is much more than simply behaving properly because we can see what you're doing. It is also sharing a lot more. And it's also very much more something that we are, we are going to have to do. Why? Because we are going to be in a situation where the economy, found, which is based on work for everybody and uh, raises for every year in your uh, salary, and uh, this is gone. M people are talking all the time now about robots taking over. So, you know, more than half the jobs available today are actually not going to be available. So how does the government, how does a people, forget the government, how does a people react to a situation like this? They change the rules of the economy. They change the rules of distribution. They have to. I don't know, I think it's war, which is always, it's also very much, you know, threatening. War is that with all. So we've got to be very careful how we're going to handle that. So it's, I believe that eventually people will come to, just for survival's sake, to some kind of sane decision. And that's why this is part of the same decision. And, and, and also the very big, it, yeah, and also in the future, these government want to become, governments this time want to become popular. They're gonna actually start thinking about projects like this because they will say, that's the way to, your reputation is fundamental now. Reputation, your reputation capital is what you, is your biggest capital today. And will be forever more. So I see that as a good motivation to change politics. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you so much, Larry. Thank you so much.